Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. I see others in the room, but their mics are muted and their cameras are off. I can hear you, John. Councilman Bonnie can hear me. That's all we need, Councilman. Well done. You're now in ITA as well as the council office. I will do so.
afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Transportation Committee meeting of Tuesday, June 1st. Um, I am joined by my colleagues, Joe Buscaino, and I believe Paul Coretz is here. I thought I saw him. Uh, he'll be here with us in a second. Uh, his chair and his desk are here right now, so he should be there. There we go. All right. So uh, we get Bonin, Buscaino, and Coretz. Uh, the gang is all here. Um, I will begin by reading the instructions for public comment for those who'd like to comment on today's agenda items or in general matters under the jurisdiction of the Transportation Committee. Uh, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 669-254-5252, that's 669-254-52, and use the following meeting ID number, 161 seven five zero five zero seven nine and then press pound and then press pound again when prompted for your participant id and then once admitted into the meeting press star nine to request to speak uh, all right i believe we are ready to begin um colleagues uh i was going to recommend that uh, items two and three, uh, we move on consent, uh, unless anybody had any objections. Second. Okay. Um, oh, I, before, yeah, before we actually vote on that, we need to see, is there any public comment? Yes, there is. Okay. Uh, why don't we do the public comment first, and then we'll uh, vote on moving those two items. Okay. Uh, moving to the phones, we have, um, let's see, first caller will be with the last four digits, 1133. Please um, identify yourself and uh, which items you'd like to speak on. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, this is Farbod Nozad. Uh, I'm calling uh, in regards to item number five. Okay, you have 60 seconds. You may begin. Great. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you guys so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. As I mentioned, my name is Farbod Nozad, and I live in uh, the West Hollywood neighborhood of Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, I, I called in today because I just want to let you guys know how much I love Coco. Um, and the convenience and affordability that it's provided for myself and my family, especially um, during this pandemic and, you know, as we've kind of been trying to navigate uh, our new lives here in Los Angeles. And I definitely want to, you know, uh, support my favorite restaurant um, around here uh, and, and continue to you know, be able to enjoy that convenience. And so um, I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, there is not an overly restrictive cap uh, placed on this program, and that COCO will continue to be able to do business um, in Los Angeles. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, next up with, is the caller with the last four digits, 5349. Your line is, in, is open. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, may, can you all hear me okay? We can. Hello there. My name is Jill Galbraith. I live in the east side of Los Angeles. Uh, similar to the gentleman Farbod, I would love for restaurants and markets in Los Angeles to have access to delivery services like Coco for a myriad of reasons, but among them because Coco allows businesses affected by the gravity of the pandemic to save on their expenses. Coco is more sustainable than car-based delivery due to the economy of their size. And Coco provides a convenient and yet affordable way for residents to support businesses in their local neighborhoods. Uh, to me, Coco is the future of street delivery, and I want to see this technology revolutionize industries while conserving resources and bringing communities closer together. Like my community! I love my community! I love Los Angeles! Thank you very much for your time. I shield the rest of mine. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the caller with the last four digits, 4207. Please identify yourself. Again, 4207. Sorry, can you hear me now? 
Yes, we can. Sorry, I mean, I'm just looking at it. I was that guy. Uh, my name is Logan Dab. I'm the general manager of Truth and Kitchen in Santa Monica. Um, and I really want to speak about as we expand our restaurant, we're in a really fortunate place that we were able to find the pandemic and look to open new locations. And we're very eagerly awaiting some openings in more downtown LA. And I really want to talk about jobs and being able to open and hire more people that live in the area is really critical for us. And using the platform such as Coco has increased the business in Santa Monica enough that we've been able to bring on more staff. And I can see the same, I can anticipate the same results if we open more another location in downtown. Um, and just really want to keep employing local people and keeping the people in the area happy and great. And, you know, Coco's been really great you know, generating more revenue and being super reliable. And just in cutting costs, but really just help us bring on more people to the demand that they're, demand that they're bringing to us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have uh, last four digits, one, two, six, four. Please identify yourself and which items you'd like to speak on. Please unmute yourself. Yes, now we can hear you. Is this, is this for one, two, six, four? It is. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a public comment, please. Okay, go ahead. You have 60 seconds. Okay, uh, yeah, we have a problem in our neighborhood uh, with uh, multiple charter buses coming through there 24 hours a day, um, parking in no parking anytime towaway zones and also parking on bus stops. And uh, we have some that have Mexican license plates, so I don't know what the admission standards is with those, uh, because we have an air, we live in a low income area that uh, has a, what they call a freeway advisory notice for sensitive use, meaning that we get a lot of pollution and the buses just bring more of that pollution. So we need to, uh, hopefully stem that situation and uh, put it somewhere else where it's not affecting the residents so much. Uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Um, next up, we have a caller, the last four digits, four, or sorry, 5402. 5402, your line is open. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Caller, the last four digits, five, four, zero, two. You can hear me now? Now we can hear you, yes. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Zach Rash. I'm the co-founder and CEO of COCO. Good afternoon, Chair Bond and council members. On behalf of COCO, I want to express our gratitude to you and the LADOT team for your thoughtful consideration of regulations for personal delivery devices. COCO is thrilled to have worked closely with community members, local businesses, business improvement districts, chambers of commerce, and the LADOT team, council offices, and council members in piloting our service in San Pedro and in Venice. The pandemic has created a huge burden on local restaurants and has forced them to increasingly rely on car-based delivery to reach their customers. These services are often incredibly expensive for both restaurants and customers alike. Car-based delivery also pollutes our air and generates additional traffic. This is where Coca comes in. We've partnered with businesses like San Pedro Brewing Company and Adrift Burger Bar in Venice to carry their local deliveries at about half the cost of car-based delivery services, reducing CO2 emissions, as well as removing cars from our already crowded streets. Overall, we think the proposed regulations are well-constructed and will provide a good framework for operation of personal delivery devices in our community. However, there's one high-level concern we have about the proposal. We think that vehicle caps are unnecessary for this type of service. Setting a cap citywide as proposed would severely limit the potential of the service to support businesses across the city and to get cars off the road. Unlike shared e-scooters, our vehicles are much more expensive and have, we have no incentive to flood the market with devices to attract riders. Each one of our vehicles is attached to a restaurant or market's actual delivery needs and represents cars taken off our streets pollution out of our air and additional dollars left in the pockets of local businesses and customers. Restaurants all over LA can benefit from our service and we don't want to have it we don't want to have to turn any of them down due to the cap. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Next caller is uh, with the last four digits, 
Council members for your time. My name is James Rulecki and I'd like to express my support for Coco Delivery. I live in Venice and was a heavy user of their service during the pandemic and continue to be a huge fan and believer in what they're doing. They've been a great contact contactless delivery service and extremely re reliable. I'd hate to see the timeliness and usefulness of the service decrease if a small vehicle cap was set in place. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next caller is um, last four digits uh, 3897. 3897. Your line is open. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can. I'm calling in regards to item number five. Okay, go um, ahead. You have 60 seconds. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And thank you, council members, for your time. Uh, my name is Josh Dubin. I'm a resident of Marina Del Rey uh, and love all of my local favorite restaurants, the Ano, Whaler, Great White. I have a lot of friends and family in the restaurant business, so it's been hard to see a lot of them struggle during the pandemic. Um, I know that one thing that kept restaurants alive was the ability to deliver affordably uh, to customers during the pandemic, uh, but it has become clear that the economics of some of the current delivery options uh, really cannot be relied upon. So I would love to see a service like Coco, which has started to help a lot of these businesses in Santa Monica and Venice to expand, um, and I really support that growth. I think that whatever we can do to reduce any barriers that restaurants face, uh, both logistical and economic standpoint, should be our primary objective since these are businesses that have been hit so hard during COVID lockdown. So I ask that City of Los Angeles really look into Coco and allow Coco to grow within uh, Los Angeles to see these restaurants thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, next up we have the caller with the last four digits, um, 1403. Yes, I'm in a general comment, please. Okay, you have 60 seconds. No, no. I, I, I asking for all the items to speak on and the general public comment. Okay, you have 60 seconds for general public comment and, and two minutes for all the other items. Yeah, right. Right, we're speaking from the world famous transportation niggas of 501c3 pending my food. Yeah, we get to number one. Man, yeah, niggas are looking at the department project. Pedestrians and cyclists don't get along with one another. That's what I hear. So I support pedestrians, but I don't like bicycles. Let's ban all bicycles in the L.A. city, especially in CD5. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Corrad. That's how that motherfucker say his name. Number two, no truck bus out of it. The goddamn time. Too many times I go down and get my bagel. I get my cream cheese. And I get my ham hocks. And the goddamn buses are idling at 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the up, morning. Time's up. Move on to your general public comment, please. Uh, what? Hello, niggas. Oh, that's my nigga there, my bony nigga, yeah, that's right. So that motherfucker don't want nobody talking. But let's talk about number five. Now, I do my delivery. I want all unlimited cards, unlimited fleet, so that we can go from Marina Derry. The great Janus Hahn, the savior of the black community, and the juju bed. I want unlimited delivery, and I want... $15 an hour plus mileage. And I will continue to deliver killer shrimp all over there. While Mike Bonham continues to allow the homeless to burn down, it. You can't have a barbecue without motherfucking shrimp. 
and our shrimp is the best yet. So support Marina Del Rey. Do not interfere with our business model. Give us some liberty to drive it Time so is that up. we Next may do it your good. Okay, moving on to the next caller. We have last four digits, uh, 2271. 2271. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, hi everybody. Um, I am a business operator in Los Angeles. Um, with multiple businesses. Um, for us, it is super important that we get our food to our guests in the most timely manner possible. Um, after the recent year of COVID, um, being hit with the delivery fees from the third-party platforms has greatly hindered our ability to sustain um, employees, um, pay them a living wage, um, as well as um, provide a wonderful experience for our guests. Um, just because of the, the siphoning of our, of our profit. Um, having the, the cocoa company um, and the robots do the delivery for us would greatly, greatly give us a step up and uh, uh, an upper hand on, on recovery for uh, the year that we've, we've experienced. Um, I, I have employees that look at me to make these decisions for them um, and to help provide for them. Um, and without the ability to, to create a, a profit or, or a, a business that, is healthy and, and, and thriving because of these delivery platforms is just, you know, it's, it's disappointing. And, and, and I don't have much of an explanation for my team, you know, and I know like the, the DoorDash company did 300 and million, uh, 300 million um, in profit for July. Um, and I can tell you that we contributed to that huge profit, but didn't get to see the same return um, at all. Um, and I think Coco, again, would give us the upper hand to be able to just do everything we possibly could for, for our guests and, and for our employees and for the general food culture of Los Angeles. Um, so any restriction would just hinder us greatly. So Thank you. I guess that's all I have to say. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up is caller with the last four digits, 6177. 6177. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Nico Petrov, and uh, I live in Venice and spend most of my time around Santa Monica, uh, Marina del Rey, Venice, and Westwood. Um, between working in Santa Monica and living in Venice, food delivery is pretty much one of the most important things uh, to my lifestyle. And Coco is pretty much a step up um, in terms of both affordability and convenience. Um, really, uh, food delivery from, from DoorDash or Postmates has, has become too high in fees, so I actually found myself over the pandemic cutting food delivery out of my, um, you know, regular purchases, and therefore not being able to support the local restaurants that I usually um, would get deliveries from. So Coco has really been just a lifesaver in terms of an affordable um, and easy to use option um, in the local uh, community. So um, yeah, any any restrictions that are being placed on on their program would um, would definitely be a hindrance, and I'd, I'd appreciate to. Uh, let them uh, continue as uh, as usual. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Okay. The, we have two more callers that don't have their hands up. If, this is our last chance for to have a comment. If you would like to speak, press star nine to raise your hand. Okay. No more takers. That closes public comment. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody who called and weighed in. Um, so we are going to uh, do a roll call on uh, approval of items uh, two and three. Very good. Recommendation is to approve items two and three. Council Member Bonin. Aye. Council Member Koretz. Aye. Council Member Buscaino. Aye. The matters both are approved. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, on item number one, which is the general manager's uh, remarks and employee recognition, my understanding is we don't have a, a report or um, uh, employee rec uh, or recognition set up for today. Um, uh, so we're going to continue that item um, or just do it next time. Uh, so that brings us to item number four, which is uh, Mr. Mr. Buscaino's motion uh, regarding uh, uh, cracking down on street harassment. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for swiftly uh, agendizing uh, this item in committee. Uh, this motion, members, is a uh, very important one for me. It addresses the prevalent issue of street harassment against a broad range of demographics in our city. In it, we're calling on the CLA, DOT, and several other key departments to um, report back on all soft approaches available to the city to curb street harassment, such as educational campaigns, bystander training programs, mandatory city personnel training. Motion has been uh, carefully researched and crafted for over now six months. I do want to thank my alleged deputy, Laura Hill, uh, for helping take the lead on this. We noticed the motion when we um, did most like when we saw the spike in, in the recent spike in verbal and physical harassment against API and Jewish communities. Um, and while this is a nationwide issue, dense cities such as LA has have been hit the hardest and we therefore have a duty to respond. Uh, the motion was purposely written to cover a broad range of vulnerable populations. And this is because the reality, unfortunately, is that many individuals across all demographics and differences are victims of street harassment in Los Angeles. However, it is worth noting that women, and in particular young women, are statistically the most targeted population, most often appearing in the form of sexual harassment. The data shows that street harassment begins at a very young age population, around nine or 10 years old and the psychological effects of repeated incidents over time can be severe, as you can imagine. This most is before us um, is personal to me, I think, about my daughter, who I always want to protect. She uh, should always be safe walking in our city streets or taking our city transit system. It's our duty to protect our children, mothers, seniors, every vulnerable population in our public spaces. Additionally, it's critical that we start thinking about safety in public spaces, not just in terms of infrastructure, but in terms of policies and programs that protect individuals as well. As the city continues to make large capital investments to enhance pedestrian and rider safety, the issue of street harassment and personal safety must be on top priority or else vulnerable populations will continue to use other travel options available to them. For all these reasons and many more, I uh, made it priority to introduce this motion with the support of six of my colleagues. I do want to thank um, the others who uh, signed on to this motion before us. And as stated in the motion, many other major cities have already implemented successful campaigns to combat the issue of street harassment. I've learned from some of our colleagues who are National League of Cities affiliation, particularly some of the members in Washington, D.C., Chicago, Atlanta, San Francisco. So it's time that we catch up with other major cities and protect our most vulnerable in our public spaces. So thanks again, Mr. Chair, for scheduling this quickly. I ask for your support. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Buscano, and thank you and the co-authors uh, uh, for the motion. In, in this committee, we, we more often than not focus on the, the physical aspects of transportation, the, the infrastructure and the vehicles, and we and we don't talk enough about the social aspects. Uh, so I appreciate this this motion, uh, and uh, we've been doing some work on this over at LA Metro, which I believe your motion references. Yes. Um, uh, particularly over the past several years, regarding uh, the uh, sexual harassment of uh, of women on our our, our trains and buses, uh, and I'm glad to see this goes even broader and looks about looks at the other types of harassment we've been seeing as. Hate seems to be finding all sorts of new ways to make itself manifest in, 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 in public spaces and public discourse, uh, particularly over the past few months. Um, and, you know, uh, I've often said, if you don't have freedom of movement, you don't have freedom. And this impacts people's freedom of movement. So it, it's yes. important to, to, to get to it. Um, uh, and I want to thank you for uh, particularly calling out um, the Civil Human Rights and, and, and Equity Department, which I think is really, really very important. Um, one, because uh, 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 people who are, are impacted by a lack of equity are some of the people who are most impacted by uh, the, the street harassment. But also when we enforce things, they also tend to be the ones who tend to get enforced against most. So I think it's very important we have them uh, uh, in the, the, the conversation about even this, this um, uh, the, the, the soft approach. Uh, and I want to thank you for calling out the work of the PSAC, the Public Safety Advisory Committee over at Metro, which is uh, doing some great work to engage the community on ways to make passengers feel safer. So 
this is all uh, uh, great stuff. The only thing I was going to suggest is in addition to the departments listed, uh, we also include uh, the Bureau of Street Lighting, uh, since in some cases having uh, better lighting might be yes. helpful. Um, so, uh, Mr. Koretz, do you have any, uh, I see your hands up. Yes. Um, well, I, I would commend you as well for uh, all the different elements of this. And of course, uh, in, in recent months, we've seen a lot of API and Jewish community uh, hate actions. Um, I'm just curious, since uh, this is Transportation Committee, uh, on our own transportation systems, uh, uh, DASH and Commuter Express, have we had much of the same kinds of problems that, uh, that this references? Uh, is uh, Connie here from DOT or, uh, or yeah, or uh, Carrie? Hi, this is Connie. I'm sorry, Council Member Kretz, I missed the question. Would you mind uh, asking it one more time? Oh, I was just curious if, if these same kinds of problems have taken place uh, on Dash and Commuter Express within the city as opposed to just Metro which we don't uh, directly operate. Well, um, hopefully uh, Carrie uh, from our transit team can provide more detail. I do know we survey our passengers on our DASH system across the board, across all of our lines. Um, and we do ask them questions about safety concerns they might have. I don't know that we drill down to be specific about what types of issues they've faced personally, um, but that might be something that we can explore as a part of this motion is how we drill down a little bit further to identify what the concerns are. Yeah, just be curious. Uh, otherwise, this is a, a great concept. And thank you, Mr. Buscaino, for bringing it forward. Thank you, Mr. Koretsis. If I can, Mr. Chair, through you, uh, just note that uh, sexual harassment in, in, in transportation networks are one of the most unreported incidents. Um, and this is why we want to drill down on this and, and raise awareness and with the ultimate goal of putting a stop to it. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, uh, I also understand this is uh, referred to the Immigrant Affairs, Civil Rights, and Equity Committee. Uh, so, why don't uh, uh, we take a vote to approve this, including uh, Bureau of Street Lighting and the instruction, and uh, get it over to them so they can get it to Council real quick. Um, let's uh, do a roll call, Mr. White. Yes, sir. Recommendations to approve the motion as amended to add the Bureau of Street Lighting. Roll call. Councilmember Bonin. Aye. Councilmember Koretz. Aye. Councilmember Buscaino. Aye. Motion is approved as amended. Great. Okay, that brings us to item number five. Uh, robots, robots, robots. Uh, the LA DOT report um, on personal delivery devices regulatory framework. Uh, but when I say robots, my seven-year-old gets a lot more interested. So. Um, I believe we have Jarvis to uh, give us a report. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. My name is Jarvis Murray, and I'm with the uh, LADOT's For Hire Division. And uh, we are the group that manages permitting of uh, private vehicles that operate on the right of way. And so uh, I do want to thank everyone for allowing us to come and present on this issue. Um, as some of the callers have mentioned before, um, you know, there was a, a big growth of delivery services during our, the pandemic and many businesses were seeking ways to reopen and to regain and retain their customers. And so this option has been coming about and um, we're excited about it because it is zero emission delivery devices. Uh, we're going to be calling them personal delivery devices, uh, but they are zero emission. That will be a requirement of our regulations. We're excited because they will be taking cars off the road and as part of the permitting process, it'll allow us to manage the best use and, and performance of our right of way. And um, so before I, I kind of launch into what we're talking about here, I do want to just thank um, some of the companies for their cooperation uh, and answering a lot of our questions. Uh, <clears throat> KiwiBa and Coco have been very uh, forthright and forthcoming in, in working with us as we, you know, keep continuously asking them questions about the, the use of their devices and how they work. Uh, so we want to say uh, we really appreciate that cooperation and we hope that that cooperation continues uh, as we hopefully move into a permitting program. So as we look at these devices, we're looking at them primarily for sidewalk use. <clears throat> and as we began working on this with other uh, city family partners here, we determined that the LADOT will be the 
the best uh, body for permitting, but that Streets LA would be would better manage the enforcement of the sidewalk. And again, when we look at these devices, we're talking primarily about sidewalk use um, with also use in the crosswalk. But the report that I'm talking about today is really focused on permitting and the operations and really just creating a basic framework for the operation of these devices. Um, we're asking that uh, Streets LA, um, which we have worked with, but we think that they will come back um, and be a stronger um, discussion about uh, enforcement and the robust enforcement that they can entail as they manage our sidewalks. Uh, so hopefully six months from the start of this program. So some of the basic things that we're looking at, you know, obviously we're gonna want the companies to comply with our insurance requirements, our data requirements, our, ind our indemnification requirements. But along with that, you know, we are requiring the operators of these PDDs to follow certain things. And that includes yielding to the right of way of pedestrians, obeying all digital physical signs regarding traffic and pedestrians, um, not interfering with the maintenance of path, uh, with, you know, the path of travel for persons with disabilities. Um, we're asking that they not transport or requiring that they not transport waste or hazardous materials, obviously. Um, making sure that they're equipped with headlights that operate at night, sunrise and sunset, and having markings that clearly identify where they are, you know, who they're with, um, you know, and something that allows vehicles as well as pedestrians to see them uh, easily on the right of way. Initially, you know, as we set this program together, you know, we were putting together and we had created a cap of 100 vehicles or 100 devices per company. And part of that for us is frankly, it's a resource issue. Um, you know, at, at 100 vehicles, we felt that as a DOT, as a permitting body, we could easily manage, um, you know, the, the deployment of those devices on the right of way. We don't expect large scale deployment initially, um, but, you know, assuming that the program becomes successful, we do expect that we may need to come back and make changes um, later on in the year or closer to, to the end of the permitting year uh, as we learn more about these devices. So really, I, even though we're creating this, this permitting program, we really are looking at this as also um, somewhat of a, of a pre-trial period uh, as we learn, you know, how this is really going to work on our streets, you know, which, which areas um, is, are this, is this program best going to serve, uh, as well as, you know, how it's going to work for the businesses and how it's going to work in terms of us managing and collecting data um, and things of that nature. So we did set that cap, but we did expect companies to come if they become really successful and request more vehicles. So uh, we're absolutely open to them making that request and moving forward. Uh, but we also, again, resource for us is we were a little bit concerned about oversaturation uh, in the city. So with, that's why we created uh, the cap that we did. Um, part of that is particularly if providers focus all in one area. What we didn't want was every provider putting all of their vehicles in just one neighborhood. Um, so we're hoping that if we start off slow, we will get an opportunity to help them help guide and grow the program throughout the city in places, again, um, that can best use, uh, 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 best use this type of service. So that's, that's our, our issue with resource constraints. If we, have vehicles that are over 100 um, vehicles, you know, we definitely feel that um, our permit fees would need to increase to manage that. Right now we're asking for, you know, a simple permit fee. We know a lot of these companies are small and are gonna start small. We ask for a permit fee of between one and 50 vehicles, uh, one and 50 devices for $10,000 permit and annual renewal and, and 20,000 if you're doing 50 or more vehicles uh, with an annual renewal. But if it goes beyond that, the things that we really have to manage in terms of the cost to us would include managing digital right of way, um, you know, managing these devices on MDS and including just the work, the onboarding, the permitting and the monitoring of, of the program. And, you know, with a handful of vehicles, you know, we know we can do that. We know we can manage that with our current staffing constraints, but with a lot more vehicles, we definitely would need some resource help. So I, I do want to just put that out there. Um, but I do also wanted to let you know in terms of operations, um, you know, I know that many people are concerned that, oh, this is gonna be this, anything technology, everyone thinks about the scooters, but this is unlike, unlike the dockless scooters, these are not devices that are to be left unattended on the right of way. They're meant to go from their, their local restaurant delivery location to the home or, you know, complex delivery and spend as much time as is needed to dwell 
um, but they're really there to just to dwell, deliver, and return or move to the next delivery. And we're, and again, as I mentioned, we expect them to operate on the sidewalk primarily, um, but we've limited their their miles per hour to five. So we're allowing them to operate on the sidewalk at no more than five miles per hour, which is approximately walking speed. Um, you know, walking speed is between three and, and five miles an hour. And we wanted something that was going to be unobtrusive, but also not something that's going to, you know, run over someone or, or cause great fear if it's moving down the sidewalk. Um, it's important to note <clears throat> that we've created the regulations to allow for autonomous delivery, but right now they're still mostly remote, remote operated. You know, we're not there with autonomy, but, you know, we are looking at a potential autonomous future. But importantly for us, and as we've talked to the providers particularly, they're currently remote control. So there is someone who is guiding the devices. And so as it relates to if we have broken sidewalks, uprooted trees, one, you know, they'll be able to collect that information. And if, you know, street services would like to request that information, they'd be able to send that information to them about these areas. And and again, this is this will be helpful for us because if this program grows and expands tremendously, we could use the program fees to reinvest in the infrastructure and the maintenance and repair of the infrastructure of the sidewalk. So while we're starting small, if the program becomes successful and it grows and we grow beyond again, 100 vehicles per company or something along those lines, the permit fees should increase and it should be factored in that using the right of way, using the sidewalk, we would expect some contribution to help us maintain the infrastructure uh, and repair the infrastructure as it goes along. But again, as I was mentioning, these are primarily remote piloted. And so therefore, when there is an issue, there is someone who's going to back the vehicle up. Um, they're going to reroute. And that is something that uh, we will be looking at again digitally. We're going to be managing these devices through the MDS platform, much like we manage the scooters. And during this early period, as we move along, we expect to begin adjusting the requirements as necessary, including learning information re related to the infrastructure, as well as getting information and data on routes used, the time and distance that's spent on sidewalks <clears throat> versus the street or crosswalks. And this includes for us reviewing and even looking to the companies to embed technology or endpoints that will help us determine the amount of time that's spent on a sidewalk. And these things will help us to actually improve our stewardship of the right of way. And so, you know, lastly, uh, one of the important things to us is uh, equity. And while we recognize, again, this is a, it's, it's going to start off small scale. And what we wanted to do is as the program grows, we're expecting the companies and we're going to require the companies to engage with communities, you know, whether it's neighborhood councils, uh, business improvement districts, you know, to talk to them, you know, about entering their neighborhoods and the things that are important and can be done to ensure that there's, you know, safe delivery, effective delivery, and and something that reaches out to the community at large. This is also means that for us, as we look to other areas of the city that could use this type of service, you know, if we have a lot of restaurants and parts of the city that's currently not being served and they too feel like, hey, we would like to have access to this type of service, you know, we'd want to work with those communities and our providers to begin, you know, if necessary, requiring deployment requirements in those areas. Right now, it's still a little too early for that, but we do expect that as the program begins to grow, um, that we would be looking into, okay, it's growing, it's successful, it's working. Now we want to, you know, push, you know, the, you know, the equity principles in terms of, hey, this neighborhood sees that it's working and they would like it, we would like to, we'd be able to do that as part of the permitting program. So uh, those are kind of the, the primary uh, things, you know, and, and I don't want to take it to be uh, too long winded, but that is the basic overall framework attached to our report. We did provide um, rules and guidelines um, that are much more detailed related to the things that we were expecting and some of the reporting requirements and, and operational requirements. And so, um, you know, I, I will give it back to the committee and open itself up for questions here. And thank you all very much. Uh, thanks, Jarvis. Uh, lots of questions, and I'm sure my colleagues will have them as well. Uh, first of all, thanks for explaining the ways in which these are not like scooters, uh, because uh, I, 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 for one, am having scooter PTSD uh, for some of the experiences uh, that we had. Um, uh, particularly with oversaturation in, in, 
in Venice and in a couple other areas in my district. So thanks for explaining the difference there. This is this is interesting because they, they they don't hopefully stay on the sidewalk and they're really designed to, to help our, our struggling restaurant industry, which I think we're all interested in 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 supporting. Um, you know, but with 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 technology, there's always challenges we face. What I like about this is we're more ahead of the game than we were with uh, scooters and other dockless uh, devices, and I think that's a good thing. I, I do want to be clear, though, that what we're talking about, because some of the, 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 the callers um, uh, made it feel as, seem, seem as if this is a an established, a completely established citywide program. This is a pilot. This is how we are testing things out. This is how we figure out what our, our long-term regulations will be. Uh, and, and this isn't a, um, uh, a, a complete uh, blanket uh, approval going forward. Uh, this is just uh, the beginning and there will be adjustments to come. Uh, a couple different questions um, uh, in, in no particular order. You, you talk about Streets LA doing enforcement. Uh, what level of, of engagement have we had with Streets LA up until now? Uh, we've had a good level of engagement um, and primarily with their, their planning side. And we've had some discussion with um, the chief over there um, on the, investiga the investigatory side. Um, but again, they manage the sidewalks. And so as we were putting this uh, report together, um, you know, it's still really early and everyone is unclear about, you know, what exactly we're going to be in need to manage. And so to that extent, Streets LA is, is really the best group to really talk through uh, their enforcement needs and, and things of that nature, including the infrastructure needs and the things that they see related to the sidewalk. I, I, I get that, but is Streets LA ready for us to, to say go on this? Um, I believe that they are, uh, and I believe that they're ready to sit, to come back with a, with a report in six months, which is why we asked for them to come back with a report. Well, it's going to be sooner than six months, at least that's the direction I'm going to walk in. But um, uh, what we're going to need to know before this gets to council is is Streets LA okay with this? Because if this gets to council and 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 Adele or somebody's coming up and saying, "What the hell are you talking about? We we we're we're, we're blindsided," then that that's going to be a, a, a problem. Going to make sure uh, both of those agencies are, are on board. Um, uh, I'm I'm in, I'm I'm reading Mr. Caretz's mind, so I'm going to ask about advertising. Uh, what sort of advertising is allowed or prohibited on these devices? For, well, for now, in our rules and regulations, we're allowing advertising related to the business that they're working with. So if it's like, let's say, you know, San Pedro Brewery, and it's a delivery device for San Pedro Brewery, you know, it, it's fine for us if San Pedro Brewery has some advertising on the delivery device about, you know, their restaurant or, you know, call this number or something along those lines. So for now, that's the, that's the extent of the advertising. Uh, that we're allowing, it's really related to uh, the client and the client being the business that is using uh, the device as well as the company. So whether it's uh, the operator, meaning Coco or KiwiBot, whomever, they would also be able to advertise their services on, on the devices. But for now, we're restricting it to that. And is uh, that advertising limited to static advertising? Um, as opposed to digital? As opposed to digital? You know, Right now, I think we've stayed silent on the digital advertising. Right now, we're we're completely fine with static, but we have not uh, made a requirement for for digital advertising. I, I think you need to not be silent on it and leave it at static. Okay. Um, the I, I have a question. I know there's a, a regulation about the weight. There's a maximum weight of, of 100 pounds. Yes. What about uh, the, the the dimensions? I know that you're requiring like a flag or something so people can see it, but um, uh, is, is there anything that regulates uh, how wide they can be or how tall they can be? Not at this time. Uh, and again, you know, each provider has slightly different uh, devices. So we really just focused on the weight at this time. But again, because it's, it's a little bit early, we do want to see how it looks and how it's going to work on the streets. And so we, we left, uh, we didn't go into that, but we really just focused on the weight of the device. Yeah, I think you need to look at the dimensions before a, a, a company invests in something that, that may be problematic for us. 
you know, we want to make sure, you know, working with streets LA, that there's a certain width that is maintained on, on the sidewalks and stuff like that. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure that we want something which is a big, long, tall pole or something like that that goes up 10 feet, you know. Uh, uh, so I think you need to, to, to think about that. And I'd, I'd like the department to have the ability to sort of refine those those regulations as we, as we go on. Uh, and we are uh, indemnified if one of these things uh, hits somebody or causes uh, an accident of some sort or collision. Yes, that's a, a, the major part of the regulation. We do have the indemnity language um, and we, it's, it's indemnity language that's standard for us. And it also applies to uh, our darkless program, but, and that, that language has worked very well for us, uh, we think on the darkless side. So um, we've pre presented that language to the providers. Um, they've seen it and they are, they're, you know, they recognize that that's, that's part of the deal for operating in the city that you have to indemnify the city. Okay, and then, then here's sort of what I think is the, the sort of the, the question at the heart of this uh, for us and 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 for the council, uh, and it was sort of at the heart of some of the testimony today is uh, what, if any, should the, the, the cap be on the number of devices? Like I said, some of us have experienced a lot of heartburn over the, the inundation we got of the scooters, and while these are different, we're, we're certainly sensitive uh, to that, uh, and we... Uh, want to be able to achieve equity and not allow somebody to put everything in in Venice and you know nothing in in, in other parts of uh, of the city. We want to make sure all parts of the city get served. So um, when we talk about the maximum number, um, you say that is largely a function of your staff capacity. If Streets LA is doing the enforcement. What bearing does the number of them have on your staff's capacity to to manage them? Well, again, we're still monitoring the devices. So, for instance, we're requiring three-on-one integration uh, as well as monitoring them through MDS. So, we still do have some, you know, quote unquote, skin in the game related to how they're going to be operating on the right of way. And so, to the extent that they continue to grow. I think that's correct in that as they continue to grow, that's and the enforcement needs grow. Um, Streets LA would absolutely need to be able to, you know, opine about what the right thing is, how many investigators that may require, you know, that type of thing. But in terms of our side, um, you know, we still have a lot of, for instance, you know, we manage the Dockless program as well, and we are also sensitive to, you know, the saturation issues. And part of our monitoring, even absent, um, the compliance pieces are, you know, we monitor digitally daily. You know, I have people who are looking at this regularly who are monitoring the 301 complaints regularly. And then just in terms of managing, you know, their needs related to their permits, if they want to expand to other businesses, if they want to, you know, expand to other areas, managing the outreach, you know, and even with the complaints, we're still the permitting body. And right now, even if Streets LA um, is going to report back, we still have the authority to suspend or revoke your permit. You know, with Streets LA is more involved, they could recommend that for us and we would do that work. But right now, we are still going to be the ones monitoring and managing uh, at this time for those pieces until we develop a, a much more stronger, robust compliance program. Then we could probably divvy up the duties a bit better. Okay. I, I understand. I have a much better appreciation of what your, your staffing uh, limitations are and how that dictates some limitations on this. I, I, I do think I want to see it higher than where it is so that uh, restaurants in various neighborhoods can can be served, maybe, you know, allow three neighborhoods and then additional for equity or something like that. With DOT having the ability to raise or, or lower based on staffing capacity, but uh, I'll let the other uh, colleagues uh, ask questions and weigh in, and then I'll make some recommendations at the end. Uh, Mr. Buscaino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to um, thank everyone for um, really embracing this pilot. I welcome the delivery devices to the downtown San Pedro area, which you've heard uh, from those who called in and from staff uh, through this local pilot program with um, particularly focused in, in the downtown San Pedro area. I did this because I wanted to support the small restaurants and businesses in, in my communities, most of which have been struggling to recover from the pandemic. 
by giving them additional opportunities to save money on delivery and providing more ways to get food to goods and goods to their customers. So we're able to provide a safe way for residents to order and receive deliveries five months later. Um, and after over 150 contactless deliveries, a pilot is going even better than expected. Um, Want to thank uh, our pilot partner, Coco. They've collected data from this pilot, which showed that we saved participating restaurants $5 on average per delivery. We additionally reduced emissions by 411 grams of CO2 per delivery. We were even able to create local job opportunities um, and all with zero accidents and uh, incidents. Um, to Coco, the, they have the, uh, they're given the, the the flexibility and willingness to collaborate uh, with with my office and the local businesses to achieve a, a mutual a greater goal. Um, and I want to thank Coco uh, and our partners. I have no doubt that we would find the same for our operators in, in a permitted program. Uh, one of the reasons that we were happy with this pilot, Mr. Chair and Mr. Koretz, um, is because the communities I represent are not located in central LA. We're not in downtown LA, we're not in Hollywood or on the west side, but we deserve to have access to innovative technologies and programs, just like any other major neighborhood in Los Angeles. Um, and do so that, you know, very similar to when we looked at our, our multimodal transportation networks to, to focus in disadvantaged impacted communities that will not be afforded uh, opportunities. So really proud uh, of partnering. Um, in, in moving forward on, on, on policy that will allow these types of, of uh, amenities in uh, different parts of the city. Um, my concern with the proposal before us is that the neighborhoods that would naturally receive this type of technology in an unpermitted market will still be um, the only ones who receive delivery devices um, under the proposed permit system before us. Uh, if we as a city are going to regulate something, we have uh, the responsibility to ensure we're serving all neighborhoods in LA, not just the most dense or affluent ones. Uh, and I believe, um, Mr. Chair, you're going to address that as well. And I'm happy to support um, your, your efforts. Um, also, I believe that a combination of the proposed device caps, the annual permit fee, and the missing incentive zone structure may force delivery device operators to be most active in areas uh, where there already is a high concentration of businesses and residents. Um, I do have an amendment to offer, but I'd like to have um, some questions if I may. Uh, if we can, to the staff, walk us through your methodology when developing the caps and annual permit fees. Also, the report indicates that there may be an opportunity for an operator to request additional devices above the 100 a device cap based on demand. Can you detail us? detail what that process may look like and when an operator uh, may might qualify to expand. Certainly. So um, thank you for that question. And the way that we calculated, you know, the number, well, first of all, starting with the cap number again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, part of that for us was, you know, what can we easily manage in this kind of this pre pilot period, while still allowing for a company to grow and be relatively successful. You know, we, we've seen other cities, um, you know, San Francisco, um, San Jose, they have, you know, they require, they allow only three, you know, devices. That's not enough for us. We felt to, give, to gather the kind of information we need to figure out what makes a successful program. But, you know, again, we're still new and we wanted to, to learn before, you know, a company came and decided, great, we're gonna put a thousand vehicles on the right of way you know, because we still want to figure out some of the equity issues, uh, including, you know, what we don't want is five companies, 500 devices, all in the same neighborhood. Um, I don't know if that's actually something that would really happen based upon the businesses and the business needs. But that being said, we wanted to ensure that it didn't happen. So it was really an issue for us to manage saturation and also manage with our current you know, with our current resource capacity. And so and that's how we developed the fees as well. You know, we felt that with our current resource capacity, as well as, you know, the extra, the onboarding onto the MDS and managing the program digitally, um, those are the things that we would need to do. Now, again, 
permitting a program and permitting any program, you want it to be successful. So the idea for us is, you know, we don't want to over prescribe rules right away. But one of the reasons we said we would okay them asking for more vehicles, that's because we could monitor their work as they go. So let's say that there's a company that's become very successful. They're doing really great work. Um, and then they're like, hey, you know, we're at 100. We have at least 10 more 10 more businesses that want to start with us. And that for us is another 50 vehicles. Where, you know, can we do it? Then we can go into, okay, well, where are you going? You know, um, you have this, let's say in Venice, um, you know, if you want to go to CD11, or not CD11, but you want to go out to the Valley, or you want to go to San Pedro and begin that operations, great, we have none out there. Let's add your additional 50 or 100 or whatever you may need in those areas. But if they came back and said, hey, we have 100, you want to add 100 more in the same area, and I have three other companies that have 100 more in that area, we could, we could do some analysis you know, and we have planners who can do some analysis about what does that mean? You know, how many vehicles, what does that mean for the pedestrians? And then make a decision as we go. So we recognize and we're hoping that the program becomes successful, but we wanted to have some safeguards so that it isn't just anybody. And again, this isn't like Dockless. So I don't think it behooves a company to just put a thousand devices on the right of way without any business attached to them, but we don't know. And so we want to really manage that uh, as we move forward. Thanks, Travis. Lastly, if I can, um, when developing this report, what sort of uh, consideration did you give to the uh, vastly different part neighborhoods in Los Angeles, particularly the lower income uh, neighborhoods? Well, we did give that some thought in terms of, you know, what are the things that we can think about to get them into those neighborhoods? And I think, and this is one of the reasons why we want them to communicate with the neighborhood councils. Uh, of those districts because, you know, we're not the private business. So we don't know what those restaurants want or how they want to manage their own delivery services. So if we can, you know, we're the permitting body, we can absolutely make those requirements and say, hey, we want to report back from you on your, you know, your meeting with the neighborhood council in X district or that district. And then they could let us know. And then we could communicate with the council as well, the neighborhood council and say, well, so what did you hear? What did you think? You know, um, what is important for you? You know, if there are businesses there that are like, yeah, we want this opportunity, then we can push uh, the service into those areas. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. Mr. Chair, I do have a, um, like to propose an amendment. Want me to do that now or? Uh, sure, go ahead. Okay, I just want to amend the uh, LADOT personal delivery devices rules and guidelines to exempt all personal deliver delivery devices currently active and soon to be activated in the San Pedro personal delivery device pilot from the um, proposed fleet size caps. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kretz. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm sure this will come as a shock to you, but I, absolutely detest this program. Um, I have rarely been this disgusted and probably wouldn't be had we not had our scooter experience. Um, we've gotten fewer scooter complaints in the last year plus because nobody's out on the streets. Uh, but we have a complete inability to enforce scooter rules. Uh, it's, it's been as recently as uh, I think yesterday or the day before where a senior citizen was killed by a scooter on the sidewalk gosh what a surprise with i believe two people riding it we've com been completely unable to get this uh, under control the only thing that's that's helped us in the last year has been that there haven't been the pedestrians there to kill and injure but we've certainly had hundreds and hundreds of injuries over the life of our scooter program no ability to enforce anything and so let's add some more impediments to the sidewalks. So in addition to these scooters, it almost becomes like a video game. I don't think we'll see a lot of, of accidents involving um, these particular devices, but I believe they'll cause more accidents because it's a lot like a video game with a five mile an hour additional vehicle floating on the sidewalk. 
course, this is exactly what we'd want. We want to take our cars off the streets and put the vehicles on the sidewalks instead. Intuitively, the most dangerous thing we could do. In addition, uh, we've created an almost gig economy for, for tens of thousands of people that are delivery drivers and Uber and Lyft drivers. And then we're in the process of the second phase where we'll take all those jobs. So these will slowly but surely be replaced by um, these less expensive automated uh, devices. Delivery drivers will disappear, at which point all these automated delivery services will cost just as much as the ones with drivers because there won't be a choice, they'll have a monopoly. And so what will we have accomplished? We'll make our sidewalks more unsafe, we'll take away thousands and thousands of jobs um, in, this, in, in what was a gig economy, but will now be a gigless economy. Um, the next step we'll see once taxis are gone, we will see Uber and Lyft move to automated vehicles. And five years from now, six, seven years from now, all those tens of thousands of jobs will be gone too. Um, with the danger of automated vehicles driving the streets and occasionally screwing up and killing somebody. Um, there is no great value to doing this, except for the companies themselves that will make a great profit on not paying drivers. Um, so our efforts of, of having minimum wage jobs at least pay decently, tens of thousands of these jobs will be gone. Um, and, and there's no way to replace them. Once we do it, we've done it. Um, I don't want to risk my constituents' lives and limbs any more than I did with the scooters of death that are out there now killing people. Um, I, I just think this is another bad, dangerous step in the right direction of taking away jobs and making life more dangerous for innocent pedestrians that uh, didn't sign up to be dodging these devices and scooters as well. And so I do have uh, a couple of questions. I know we'd, we'd seen these uh, on the streets pre-pandemic. I know a couple of my staff members observed them. And we just allowed them to function with no regulation during this whole period of time. No, uh, is, if that's not the question for me. Yes. Um, no, so we recognized that they were coming pre-pandemic, and at that time, you know, we, we put them on hold. Um, we were talking with them about working at Warner Center, um, as well as uh, and begin working in San Pedro, but we started to develop a program at that time, and with some cooperation, again, from the companies, they recognized that we were doing, uh, we were put, trying to put together a permitting program. We tried to move it relatively quickly um, during the pandemic, so... Uh, we began a lot of this, um, I think I want to say last summer during the pandemic. Um, and so uh, maybe not that soon, but either way, we've been working with the companies in terms of moving forward and none of them moved without informing us what they were doing. So when the when the pilot in San Pedro began, you know, Coco informed us, we talked through it, you know, we went through some things that we care about um, and, you know, we recognize that, that that's an area that really wanted it. So we did um, go ahead and, and allow them to function, but they kept us in the loop in terms of what was going on, again, as we were developing this program. So we wanted to develop it as soon as possible. And, and so now we're here uh, so that we can move it forward into a really uh, formalized process instead of uh, before kind of a, make sure you manage X, Y, and Z as you move forward. And do we have a better way to regulate these vehicles so that we're protecting seniors and the disabled because it sure hasn't worked for scooters. Um, and uh, I don't know that we can tell whether it's worked for us with these pilot programs either because we're just coming out of the pandemic. We're just starting to see large numbers of people uh, on sidewalks. And, and again, uh, immediately after we're starting to see people, we've had uh, our first death of a senior citizen with a scooter. Um, how do we know that once uh, there are resurgent scooters, there are resurgent pedestrians, and we see these vehicles out there on the sidewalks, that they aren't going to be much more problematic 
than they are now? And how do we protect the seniors and the disabled from what we've seen with scooters? Well, first, you know, we're starting by requiring them to only travel basically walking speed on the sidewalk. So it isn't the kind of thing that's kind of to sneak up on you coming, you know, at a, at a certain speed. They're going to be moving at a walking pace. Uh, the other thing is we looked at Santa Monica's program. And Santa Monica has a, a relatively robust program. They started with the zero emission delivery zone uh, for theirs. And so they started there. And then as it grew and became a little bit more successful and other businesses began to like it, they decided to expand it throughout the city. And so for us, you know, that was an indication, you know, and, and we looked at their their minutes for their discussions with their with their constituents and with the their their meetings. And in those meetings, many of the, the people and the businesses, they, they really liked seeing them, they liked having them. And, and so we felt that, okay, it's growing there, it's doing well, we think we can manage it here. Uh, but then the, the final thing I think is important, and I think the, the operators can tell you, is that these are still remote piloted. There's a person who controls them. It's not like it's just operating and it's gonna, it's gonna abut against the person and just keep knocking its head until that person moves. There's gonna be a person in the vehicle, or not in the vehicle, but controlling the vehicle who will see that, oh, this, this right of way is blocked for some reason, or it's in the way, they can back up, they can move it around. They'll be able to do different things and that's currently how they, they operate. So there is a, a remote pilot moving these devices around, ensuring um, that you know it, it's not blocking anything. And as part of our regulations, that is going to be the requirement. That is the requirement. We don't want it, you know, blocking disabled uh, pedestrians. Uh, we don't want any of that. So we will try to monitor it uh, as best we can. But I do think uh, Streets LA will come back with a better, more robust uh, way to manage the compliance related to that. Have, have we thought about what happens, though, when scooters are forced to go around these slow moving delivery vehicles? Because inevitably that'll happen. And the best path will be taken by the vehicle, and then a scooter will be passing it and possibly contacting pedestrians. Have we looked at how that will impact scooter function and how much safety that could reduce, as opposed to just viewing these in a vacuum as if scooters were, and bicycles uh, were never on the sidewalk? Well, again, you know. Scooters are required to be in the streets, and we're hoping that this puts, you know, makes them go want to go on the street and be around them. So, when we when we talk about engaging the the right of way and the sidewalk related to these devices, we were primarily concerned with pedestrian use, but we do recognize that there's not just scooters, but there's also street furniture and things of that nature. Um, again, there will be a remote pilot doing, moving, maneuvering these devices around. We can't necessarily control the independent scooter customer who's riding, and you know, and we recognize that some customers do operate recklessly, but yeah, and we but we can't control individuals. But what we can control are the companies, and then that's what we're trying to control here. We've set your speed limits. There's a remote pilot who's maneuvering the device around. Um, I can't control someone who's not permitted by me who gets on a scooter and decides I'm going to ride a little too fast, but what we can do is manage um, the vehicles that are on, on the right of way. And, and to the extent that there is additional technology, um, you know, we are looking at those things to help us manage all programs better, including sidewalk detection. Yeah, I, I would just say we've, we've proven to be completely unsuccessful in this regard. And I believe by adding these impediments, we will absolutely make our sidewalks as unsafe as possible. And many people will fear even walking on commercial streets, um, and with good reason. So I, I would recommend a, a cap in place, and I'd like that cap to be zero. OK. Um. Is that a motion? Oh. <laughs> I could get us. Courtesy second, that would be a motion. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, because I think, as everybody knows by now, I'm incapable of of uh, 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 of resisting bait. I, I need to respond to scooters of death. 
just to note that in 2019, there were 54,000 traffic collisions with automobiles in the city of Los Angeles and 236 of those were fatal. So if there is a, a moving vehicle of death in Los Angeles, it is the, the, the automobile. Um, just, I just need to note that. Um, but Mr. Kretz did, at, did raise some stuff that I do want to ask about Jarvis. Um, uh, and that is about uh, the employment stuff. And actually, this may be a question for the city attorney. Uh, I will ask this question in a way where, where both of you can answer. Uh, Jarvis, uh, do we know, um, uh, and uh, Michael, are we allowed to um, uh, require or set minimum standards for um, employment status, wages, and local hiring? I mean, I'll, I'll start. I do think in the permit in, in the permit program, I do think we can establish requirements for the permittees to have, um, you know, local hiring, you know, numbers or targets or or things of that nature for us to meet. Um, so I don't know if uh, I if, concur uh, with that. Mike has anything. I concur yeah. with that we're entering into a contract with them, just like we would enter into a contract with anybody else we contract with in the city. So, yes, you can. Okay, so we can do local hiring requirements. Uh, uh, I'm told that these are not contract employees like Uber and Lyft, but these are actual employees. Uh, is is that something we can make a condition? I believe we can, but um, I'll, I'll allow allow Mike to chime in on that. But I believe we can make it a permit condition. But Mike, are the, you know, we'll have to look at that. I believe you're right, but I I want to see are they. Uh, located locally here. You're talking about the people that are controlling the devices remotely. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. Why? I mean, are they located here? Are they located out of the country? Where are people controlling the devices located? Uh, I think each company has a, a different model. Um, so I think some are located here and some are located elsewhere. Yeah, that, that, could possibly be an issue if, if they're not located in the city. Okay. Um, so l let me do this. I'll, I'll, I'll add that to my, my, my recommendation, something about that, because I think those are important things. Um, so uh, in addition to Mr. Buscaino's recommendation, um, I'm going to recommend that we uh, approve um, and, and amend the draft regulations to limit operation in the roadway when a sidewalk is present, uh, to amend the draft application to require companies to identify uh, which neighborhoods they will serve and document engagement with neighborhood councils and, and other local organizations, um, to amend the fleet size to allow up to uh, except for the exception for San Pedro, allow up to um, 100 devices per neighborhood uh, with each operator allowed to operate in up to three neighborhoods. Operators may add up to three additional neighborhoods with an LA equity index score of 5.5 or less and that uh, additional expansions or reductions be during this pilot at the discretion of LADOT. Um, I'd also ask that we amend uh, to a 120 as opposed to 180 day report back and include recommendations on adjusting fleet size, fees and fee structures, equity incentives and saturation protections and also include information on the cost of administration and enforcement. And if dish additional positions are needed, city positions are needed for administration and enforcement to be funded by fee revenue. Um, I would also ask that that report back uh, include information from LADOT and city attorney uh, on um, minimum employment standards, uh, local hiring requirements, wage standards, and 
uh, employee status. And um, finally, direct the department to allow currently operating companies to continue uh, their existing operation in San Pedro and Venice without interruption during the transition into the new pilot program. Um, and that also would incorporate Mr. Buscaino's uh, amendment as well. I'll second those amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Mr. Kretz, you know, I second. <laughs> Not even as a courtesy. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so uh, let's call the roll. I can't hear Mr. White. Recommended. Recommendation is to approve the LADOT report as amended by Mr. Bonin and Mr. Buscaino. Mr. Bonin. Uh, aye. Mr. Koretz. Uh, to a uh, jobless dystopian future, I am a resounding no. Noted. Mr. Buscaino. Aye. Matter passes by a vote of two to one. Uh, I believe that clears the desk. Am I correct? You are correct, sir. Okay. Uh, with that, I want to thank uh, staff from DOT um, and any of the departments that happened to be here for the meeting and to my staff and uh, my colleague staffs. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.